talking to Utah's finest, Mr. Jason Lewis today. If you happen to go by Brian said, my dad and stepmom are out there skiing and snowboarding, so definitely give them my best. Nice. <laughs> Happy to be here, Carlos. Yeah, man. We'd love to hear more about you. We've interviewed the other co-founder from Investor Machine, which a ton of investors are using, done for you, direct mail, amazing data. You guys heard that on the interview with Mike Hambright a couple months ago. And then me and him also did a webinar talking about that. So we're going to dive deep into that. Jason's going to talk you know, about Investor Machine, but also guys, he's doing a ton of business in his wholesaling business, keeping some of those as well. So we want to break it all down, starting with who is Jason Lewis as far as personally, family-wise, and kind of like what you're doing now. And then we'll kind of talk about chronologically like how you got into real estate and building up, you know, doing 3 million in your wholesaling business a year. Very nice. Great. Yep. So I'm Jason uh, from Utah. Uh, my wife is Amanda uh, and I have five kids. Um, a lot of kids. When, when the fifth uh, was born, the oldest was five. So we busted them out pretty quick. And like any smart <laughs> entrepreneur, when the fourth and fifth were actually twins, uh, I went out on my own and started my business in September uh, of 2017. And the twins were born uh, in uh, November of 2017. So, you know, three months before having twins of five kids in five years is no, no better time than that. Perfect timing. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um so, I mean, my, my journey kind of starts in college. I was raised pretty like definition white middle class. Like mm -hmm. you go to school, you get a job, you make sure everything's super secure. I was also a child of the recession. Uh, so I served a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Got back November 2008, um, which is like the, the, the heart of the bottom. Well, that wasn't technically the bottom, but that was when it was getting really scary. So the name of the game at that point was security. We got to, wh whatever's most secure, make sure you do that because mm -hmm. real estate sucks. Everything's crashing. Everything's falling apart. So safest thing I could think of was uh, cancer treatment because it doesn't matter what happens with the economy, cancer's not going anywhere. So I got a degree in radiation therapy. Um, so that took me to 2012, graduated, uh, got a part-time job in it and realized like, oh, I hate this. Like I, I didn't take into account like the, enjoying this at all. Mm -hmm. So um, at that point I was like, okay, I tried the smart route. Now it's time to pursue passion uh, or at least, you know, try doing something that I like. At this point we had one little kid. So just graduated school. Uh, and uh, there was one guy I knew that was uh, invested in real estate and, um, and so uh, I hit him up for a job. I didn't know him well. I'd only ever met him one time, but hit him up for a job. I said, hey, I'll make you a deal. Teach me everything you know. You can replace yourself uh, and you know, li live the free, free life. It'll be amazing. I thought it was like the best sales pitch in the world. And he told me no. Um, so then I asked him a second time and he told me no. Uh, then I asked him a third time, uh, same answer, no. Uh, so on round four, I came back and said, tell you what, I'll make you a deal. I'm going to show up tomorrow. And I'm, you don't owe me anything. I'm just going to do whatever I can to help. And I'm going to keep showing up and keep showing up. And if there comes a point that I become worth something, all I ask is that you pay me back. And he was like, well, I mean, I guess that's hard to say no to. So went home to my uh, wife with our newborn baby who just, you know, put me through school and everything else. And I was like, you know, good news and bad news. Good news. I've got, you know, a place I'm going to go work. Bad news. I'm not actually going to get paid. Um, still, <laughs> and, uh, she was amazing, totally supported me in it. Um, so I worked for him for him for free for a month. Uh, and then at that point I'd worked my way into all of the different systems processes, businesses. And he was like a month ago, I couldn't see how I could use you. And now literally everything in the company runs through you. So I guess you better stay. So that was 2012. Um, I started as the guy, you know, getting lunch, uh, and, uh, but we, we did a lot of offering on properties back then. So it was a very different world in 2012. You could get everything you needed from the MLS, uh, HUD home store, bank owns and things like that. So we did a lot of blind offers on properties. So I was the guy that was just doing the paperwork. Five years, fast forward, when we were doing basically a home a month when I started. Fast forward, we were doing between 150 to 250 flips a year. I was what you would call in you know, typical wholesaler language today, I was what you'd call the COO. Um, and uh, 
getting close to having five kids in five years and the work-life balance just wasn't making sense and wasn't looking like it was going to make sense. So September, 2017, that's when I left um, that company and started my own thing um, and focused much heavier in on wholesales. Um, I've done, so I, I, I'm what I would call a cherry pick flipper. Um, if I do, uh, two years ago, I did 149 deals. Uh, last year I did 115, uh, but for the same amount of overall revenue, that's kind of the trend in the market, uh, fewer deals, but the same or more revenue. Um, and of those I'll flip three at a time, uh, keep a few of them as rentals, things like that. But the vast majority of what I do is wholesale. So 2017 was really just getting started. Um, 2018 um, did a million, 2019 two, and then 2020 and 2021 were both just over 3 million in assignment fees. So when I flip a property, I basically count um, all but 20,000 of the flip profit as an assignment fee. So when I say I did that many in assignments, that's kind of my, my definition of that. Fantastic. And how are we looking? We're recording this on the last day of Q1. We're off to similar projections for the year, I hope, if not a lot better. So far better. Yeah. I think we're, we're pacing for somewhere between four and five this year on 2021 or 2022. Amazing. What do you attribute that to thus far? Obviously it's on an upward slope just from your years of experience and then breaking off and doing your own thing. But what would you attribute to the most for this year? Uh, the right, right team in person. Uh, I finally got a really good COO in place myself. So, um, I'm the, I'm one of the weird ones that can be a visionary and an integrator. And so because of that, I've always kind of done both, uh, but getting somebody in to specifically be that, uh, you know, integrator person to be the leadership, because here's the other thing, you know, while building this, um, in 20, I think late 2018, 2019, uh, I had a friend in the Bay area who was like, Hey, uh, I like what you're doing. And he and I had actually worked really closely together in Utah early on. Um, but he was like, I really like what you're doing in Utah. Would you be interested in doing the same thing, you know, running marketing and lists and all that stuff for me here? And I was like, sure. I mean, it's working here. I'll do it there. And it worked. And it was like, oh, cool. Uh, I can do this here and there. And I'm doing this with his money. Um, and he's making money and I'm making money. And, and this is great. Um, so then I picked up someone in Idaho. I picked up someone in Virginia Beach and was starting to run marketing for other investors. And then uh, at an Investor Fuel event, uh, which Mike's the owner of Investor Fuel, ran into him and we had a conversation and it was like, you know, ah, angel singing. Like he, he had what I didn't have. I had what he didn't have, came together and we started growing this marketing for other people thing. Uh, and it's continued to grow and grow ever since. Um, now we're up to over 170, uh, people that we run marketing for all over the nation. Um, we, and basically what we do is we provide really, really, really good lists. And then we run the direct mail and we'll provide skip trace lists. If people want to text and cold call, or we will run and, or we will run entirely people's direct mail for them. So some of your, you know, and we, we work with everyone, everyone from some of the biggest and best people spending six figures a month with us in marketing and four or five markets all the way down to solopreneurs. Um, yeah, really low overall turnover rate. People are overall happy with us. So coming back to that, you know, tw as this things continue to ramp up, especially through 2020 and 2021, 90% of my time has started to go into this investor machine company. So what I attribute the extra growth to is, you know, I didn't really replace myself when I left the Utah company to focus on this company. So actually replacing myself, having that leadership, having the person in charge of systems processes, looking at all of those things is the main thing that's driving the growth forward from there. From a high level, in addition to the COO hire, which is fantastic, what does the rest of your team look like? And then we'll kind of break down marketing and then talk specifics around data and marketing and you know, why investor machines have been doing so well for us or for you guys. And, but we also have a lot of happy investor fuse members on that from all different price plans, like our top tier, which is the premium, which is more high volume, multiple acquisitions, um, all the way down to the essentials, believe, which is more like our starter plan, which is a couple of people on the team. Yeah. Okay. So I assume you're asking about the Utah team, right? Your Utah real estate team I'm asking yeah. about. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I figured. So I have the COO, I have two acquisition managers. 
Um, and so again, we do, um, you know, we're, we're, we're not as necessarily a small operation. Um, so I have, um, COO, two acquisition managers, a, a disposition manager, assistant disposition manager, and transaction coordinator. So one thing that's also a little bit different about us is I decided in the middle of things being really hot a little more than two years ago that I was, in addition to being really good at marketing, you know, everybody's always focused on the front door in this market, right? We're all about, if I can get more deals, more deals are going to fix all, more deals are going to fix everything. More marketing, more deals. I, sure. I own a marketing company. I'm all in on more marketing, more deals, but I got looking at it and I was like, you know, if I can squeeze an extra 5,000 out of every single one of these deals, you times that by 150 deals, like that's good numbers. Uh, you know, that's all I, without spending any more on marketing. So I actually got obsessed for a period of becoming the best at dispositions anywhere as well. So, you know, we've got a few big franchises, big groups and things like that. that are really good at dispositions. You've got like Keegley, you've got New Western Acquisitions, Net Worth Realty. So like I looked at all of their models and said, how can I bring in a lot of what these guys do, but make it like authentically me um, to, to what we do. So because of that, I have a disposition manager, assistant disposition manager, transaction coordinator, and three what I call relationship managers. So relationship managers are just in charge of building relationships with people in the community. This is both for us to get deals to buy, as well as to get deals to, to help sell deals for more. Because so much of dispositions, if you want to take dispositions to the highest level, it's much more of a relationship game than most of us give it credit for. Most of us Blast an email, blast a text and check it off, say it's done. We're going to get a good offer. Sure. I mean, it's not hard to disposition in this market. Now go, now I want you to go disposition that at 90% of ARV. You have to disposition at 90% of ARV. All of a sudden, it's not so easy anymore to disposition. So that's the thing that we've been obsessed with. And that's why I have a pretty big disposition team. Um, because, you know, most people don't check every email. I mean, how many wholesale emails do you get a day? Um, and I can't ar archive them fast enough. <laughs> right. So like we're incredibly pretentious to think that every investor is opening every email that we send. Right. Mm -hmm. So I train my people to, so that they know what, you know, what buyers are looking uh, of my buyers, who's real, who's not, uh, when are they looking, what are they looking for? So they can specifically ping them and say, Hey man, you, you want to check this one out. This one's got your name on it. Um, Get, give kind of more of that personal approach. Um, I have a team of prospectors. Uh, I have inbound, a couple of inbound lead managers, um, project manager, uh, a variety of people on the construction team, property manager, um, behind the scenes VAs that help out. Um, I'm sure I'm forgetting some. Uh, office manager. I think that's most everybody. Love it. Fantastic that you have such an emphasis on dispositions. So that's really where you make revenue and your money. But humans are just such relationship type beings that I love that you have an emphasis in such a massive team on the disposition side. I mean, I guess more so I love that you have like relationship experts or relationship managers that you really put a focus in the software world. It's like customer success managers, which are essentially doing the same thing. I mean, making sure people are using the tool and happy with service, everything like that. I'm really big on that. Even in Investor Machine, we are white glove, high touch. Everybody mm -hmm. has an account manager that only has less than 50 people for them to work with. And we are talking to all of our account manager people, all of our clients consistently, making sure that they're good, that they're on track, knowing what their results are. I get as many compliments about my account management at Investor Machine than I do like anything else in my life. Like people love the account managers. It, it, in my opinion, it's incredibly important to, to have that. Yeah. Service is huge in, in any business, whether it's, you know, done for you direct mail, investor CRM, um, you know, your real estate clients that are, are typically one-off transactions. If you're buying their house, their property at a discount, they may give you a referral, but the service aspect guys, that's not, that's like a takeaway in itself. Self, very general, like, you can always, it's free to give good service. Like you have to hire people and stuff, but as far as yeah. you personally, how you interact with people, that's something free that you don't have to pay somebody for. Like you can have great service, just you. For sure. I will say it, that doesn't necessarily make it easy though. Like every account manager I've hired, I've looked for three months 
and filtered through thousands of like applications and resumes and have a really good process of filtering them down, knowing who I'm looking for and things like that. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, we know how it is. This is 2022. It's a hot market. You, you almost can't go anywhere. It's a hot job market. You almost can't go anywhere and get good service anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's certain places and things that have figured it out, right? Like if you're having a bad day, just go to Chick-fil-A. You know, someone's going to treat you nicely at, if you go to Chick-fil-A, right? Like that's one of my goals is in all of my companies and businesses, I want to be the Chick-fil-A uh, mm -hmm. where people know if I go here, I'm going to be very well taken care of. Love that. Well, I want to come back to building a team. I want to put a bookmark in there and then kind of talk specifically about building a team, your philosophy mindset behind that. Let's talk data because this has to be a massive, I know you have a, the, the relationship people, the big dispositions, um, transaction coordination team on the back end, but let's talk data. And I want to hear just currently for this year, you're on, you're projected to have your, your best revenue year um, of your career. Yep. What have you been doing this quarter? How much of it is investor machine? Yeah. So I actually just went over this. I, I just looked at this two hours ago uh, in a mm -hmm. meeting I was in and it's, it's about right on half of my business is investor machine. So I'm both the owner and person who runs investor machine as well as uh, a client uh, of investor machine, which is good because it gives me the chance to see what, it, what it looks like on both sides. Is it working for me? Um, et cetera. So, um, so here's, here's my philosophy on data. And I've, I've always been really, really interested in the data. Um, I, uh, you know, when, when I go to masterminds and things, I don't always necessarily like super fit in. Um, I'm, you know, more interested in talking to someone. I, I'm not very like ready, fire, aim. Uh, I'm not, I'm more interested in talking about data and systems and processes and things like that than I am, you know, uh, doing like, I don't know. It, it's, uh, I master, by the way, first off, pe masterminds are amazing. I highly suggest you join one. And my favorite people on earth are my friends that are at masterminds, but that's because they like accept me and love me for my weirdness, which I'm grateful for. <laughs> so, um, this is, you know, in my journey in data, I've always been really interested in it. And I learned, you know, you've got these places like prop stream list source, things like that, where you can go and buy a list. Um, and years ago, that worked really well. It was easy. Like the first mail I ever sent, I just bought the out-of-state absentee uh, with equity list and I mailed it and it was great and it worked. But like as time, like I said before, the market's gotten tighter and tighter and tighter and that level of data hasn't gotten it done. So I've always been on the chase and on the hunt for what, you know, what data is going to be the, that's really going to move the needle and really going to make a difference. And in my hunt, I found some interesting things. One, when you pull a motivate, you know, when you pull a motivated list, right? Like let's call it the notice of default list from, uh, from list source or prop stream, like nine out of 10 of those already got foreclosed on, uh, like the, you're, you're mailing a bunch of new sellers, uh, that aren't even the, or new, new homeowners that aren't even the person that had the notice of default. So like, that's cool. I'm excited. I'm, I'm pulling a notice of default list, but like, the list isn't doing you a whole lot of good because most of those people already got foreclosed on um, and or already caught up or whatever. So, and the, the same was true for all sorts of different motivation points. By the time they make it to those national lead providers, uh, it's already old data. So what I found is the only way to get really, really good data is to get it directly from the source. So that's like directly from the county. So when I started for myself, I hired a couple of virtual assistants got logins to all of my different counties, got logins to all my different courthouses, uh, you know, found places online where I could find things. Um, and I will, and I would go get them, uh, individually and then upload them in to, um, my database to then, you know, do, do whatever I do with them, mail them, text them, call them, what, whatever investors do. So, um, so, and my results went up significantly from that because I was talking to people that actually had the motivation points that it said on the name on there. So, um, and then I started doing that for more people and more people, and then it grew into investor machine. So that's, that's, that's kind of half of what we do. That's what I call scoring the seller. So we look at all sorts of different things when it comes to the seller to give them a score of how motivated they are and how likely they would be to buy a, they would be to sell us a property. Mm -hmm. um, we've got like 
30 different motivation points that we look at and pull from, as well as some of their demographic data and things like that. But then we also like to take into account the property because, you know, if you have a seller in a 10,000 square foot multi-million dollar mansion uh, that just got a divorce uh, that owes what the property's worth versus if you have a property built in 1960 uh, with uh, an owner that's owned it for 50 years, you know, obviously this seller is going to be much more likely to be your mm -hmm. ideal seller. So we have to look at the seller and we have to look at the property. So we, we built a software that does that. So we take a look at every aspect of a property, all of those things that you would drop down on in a uh, list source or prop stream, zip code, property type, owner type, uh, equity, et cetera. And rather than just saying, I want this or I don't, we give all of those things a score of one to five. Five being I want this the most, five being one being I want this to the least, zero being I don't want it at all. So like this is my dream zip code, it gets a five, only if they're really motivated in this zip code. So we then look at every record in your entire county and say, based on all of the property scores, based on all of the motivation points we could find directly from the source and the seller scores, marry them together into a formula that spits out, this is who you should market to first, this is who you should market to last and everyone in between. So if I wanna spend 20 grand in marketing, this is who I should market to. Um, we've got a bunch of other cool things like that, that we layer in. Like if they meet this criteria, we hit them every 30 days. If they hit this criteria, we hit them every 60 days. We actually even include on the mail pieces, we address what motivation points they have. So like if they had an eviction recently, we would say, Hey, we specialize in dealing with crappy tenants. If they just died, we say we specialize in helping with probate situations because we know what motivation points they have and are going through. So, um, that's kind of that's that's the like long you know the empire state elevator ride version of uh what i love about data and what i'm doing with data love it other marketing strategies that you're doing so um the other half of my business is the networking and relationships and uh online okay. so facebook lead aggregators like need to sell my home fast fast home offer i speed to lead and uh ppc and seo Okay. Very and that's cool. this year, you know, every year that, you know, I'm a big believer in having multiple strong legs of, um, uh, of your business, right? Like every year, what one, like last year was a really bad year for online, but this year online's gone, uh, much better. Two years ago, the relationships were crushing it. You know, they're, they're all constantly doing this. And so the only way to have any type of level business is to have multiple really strong marketing arms. For sure. Are you dabbling in any telecommunications, texting, cold calling, RVM? Uh, yes. Uh, that said, my opinion on those channels is that they are overall dying channels. Uh, I don't, one that I don't do any of and never have is RVM. Um, I also, I, I have a higher, I like security more than a lot of other investors. And when things are, when you can do things in a way that it can be largely TCPA compliant. I'm okay with that. RBM definitely can't. I have friends that have gotten uh, fined, sued, whatever. So I haven't ever messed with that. Um, but I know a lot of people that have, and it's been, and it's worked well for them. Gotcha. Very cool. Uh, yeah, and a lot of people, reference. yeah. And a lot of people will text and call um, the, the same uh, investor machine data. Yep. Yeah. Same. Yep, because that's I was kind of curious on that because I didn't hear any telecommunications, but I have heard from other investor machine users of going through that data after it's it's skipped by you guys and everything like that. So, yeah, when I say half of my business uh, is investor machine, half of it is telecommunications, half of it is dire uh, direct mail. Gotcha. Appreciate it. So 25, 25, and then the variety of different online sources make up the other half. And then the, and the relationship based market. Very cool. Very cool, man. Awesome stuff. Let's talk building a team. You, you mentioned you have multiple people in acquisition seats. You have mul multiple, multiple people in dispositions, including a unique role, just the relationship managers that you have that are able to sell stuff on the back end. 90% ARV or at a high price, reach out. Depending on the touch. market. You know, I've had, the, during the summer of last year, I was like 100% of ARV. Uh, as things have cool, cooled down, I've dropped all the way to 80%. You know, now I'm sitting between 
uh, 80 and 90. So, you know, part of it is going to be the, what, what the market is and how, you know, you, you still want to maximize what buyers will be willing to pay, but I don't want to like say on here, I'm consistently wholesaling forever for 90%. I, there's times I've eaten it. There's times I've been less than that. There's, you know, we, we do the best we can. We row our boat, but in the end, we're still in the sea that is the market. And we definitely have to take whatever that is into account and bring our best based on what the given market is. For sure. I appreciate that clarity. And I also appreciate just the awareness of seeing where you're selling stuff out. I'm sure the, uh, you know, the hybrid integrator visionary that you are, I'm sure you have a nice system of knowing that and having that awareness, which is pretty cool. Just knowing yep. what you're selling. We, we look every on. week. Yep. We look every week at what our percent of ARV is and what our percent of ARV minus repairs is. And again, the challenge always with that number is what is ARV and what is repairs? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, uh, the, both of those are super subjective. We actually have a form um, when, when people offer on our properties, rather than just call and say, this is my number or email, we have everybody fill out a form specifically. It says, you know, name runs through the whole, um, gets all the information that we need. So it's all just sitting in one beautiful Google sheet. It's amazing. And I will always ask them the question, you know, hey, what do you think repairs are? And what do you think ARV is? And you, it is wild, the variation in the numbers. You know, if I have 20 people offer on one property, I'll have a hundred plus thousand dollar swing. <laughs> you know, one person will say this thing's worth four. One person will say this was worth three, 280, 350, like everywhere in between. And the repair numbers will vary widely as well. But this is, you know, using a consistent person running, uh, running numbers on our end. Love it. Building a team. Let's talk about that. You have an extensive team. I want to hear kind of your philosophy behind that. If you have any around, um, you know, in general, are you hiring ahead of the curve? as far as like when they're needed, are you hiring yeah, that, behind the curve, anything like that? Yeah, great question. So in terms of heading, hiring, so I preach in podcasts and from the stage, the importance all the time of heading, of hiring ahead of the curve. Cool. Uh, you you want to hire three months ahead. Like if you think you're going to need someone in three months, you should be hiring for them right now. Maybe even more um, to be safe. Uh, that said, most of the things that I've been a Whatever I've had my eye on at the time since I started in 2017 has grown quite quickly. Uh, last year, Investor Machine tripled uh, in size. Um, the year before that was even more than that because we, you know, when you start from really small, it's really easy to get high um, uh, high growth numbers. And so when, when you're a part of something that's tripling, it's incredibly hard to hire that far ahead of the growth. Um, so I lived most of my life in hiring too late, but I but I will definitely preach: make sure you hire at least three months ahead. So. Back to the beginning, started as a one-man show, um, and I was actually a really big follower in those early days of Dan uh, Dan Schwartz, uh, owner of Investor Fuse. And so, one of the things that he taught is build your. So he taught two things: one, build, how to build your essential four-man wholesaling team, and two, look at what your dollar per hour is on all mm -hmm. sorts of different things. You know, this is your thousand-dollar an hour stuff. This is your ten thousand-dollar an hour. Your dollar an hour. Your ten dollar an hour, etc. So. In my early days, I built out, you know, first my essential four person wholesaling team. But then from there, I would continue to build out my future org charts uh, and what things needed to look like. Um, I will say I have since learned that, yes, take dollar per hour into account like Dan teaches. But in addition to that, the thing that I wish I would have taken into account if I had it to do over again is whether or not the things that I do in the roles that I leave myself in energize or drain me. Hmm. You know, uh, most people that are looking back on their deathbed at the end of their life aren't saying, I wish I'd have made more money. They're saying, I wish I'd have spent my time better. I wish I'd have found more joy in the journey. I wish I would have had the energy at the end of the workday to be present with my kids at the dinner table. You know, I wish I wouldn't have worked so much. A at this point in my journey, I would have taken more of that into account with building out the team in terms of, you know, actually draw a list and say, these are the things that energize me. These are the things that drain me. Um, Gary Harper uh, of Sharper Consulting was actually the person that helped me um, realize that. Um, so, but early on I, I built out the org chart. And then, so I started in September and keep in mind, I had been a part of an organization before and had seen what building a flip organization was like. I'd never done it in wholesaling, but I had some principles to go with. So September 1 is when I started. Uh, in March of that next year, I had my essential team built out. 
Um, we did $100,000 that month in revenue. And I spent more than half the month visiting my sister back east and spent less than an hour a day uh, in the company. Um, so, you know, you can do it pretty quickly uh, if you know what you're doing and you do it right. From September to March of that next year, I had essentially built something that I could spend very little time on and that was bringing in overall good revenue. Now, uh, one thing that Tom Kroll says is you'll never be truly free until you can cap your financial aspirations, right? Uh, have, I've yet to take that advice. Um, so what does that over, mean exactly? Not care about okay. what? So no, just cap your aspirations, right? So you say, okay, great. I built the company this far and I've got the team to run it. That's great. Now it's this, right? Now we're going to double it. Well, doubling it means you're, you're creating a whole lot more work. Uh, and a whole lot more time that needs to be done. So now you're doing all of that until you build the team uh, to re replace yourself. Okay. So, so now, you know, in terms of like, I, I reached this point in March and it's like, Hey, we're doing good. I've got a great team. A lot of them are still with me today. Uh, we're running everything. Um, but then it's like, well, now we're going to go double it. Well, now that we're doing twice as much, that team can't do it anymore. And I wound up picking up a lot of the slack. So I'm running around working like crazy again till I build the team. Then again, then again, and then I'm like, oh, maybe I can market for other people. Uh, and then we're, you know, doubling that, tripling that, doubling that, and just continuing as you continue to grow. So, and all of this is being driven. Uh, it's not always necessarily about money. For me, it's not as much about money as it is about just growth. I mean, one of my big core values is growth and excellence. I love being able to watch things grow. And I've always kind of had a pretty hyper growth expectation behind uh um, my thought processes on a lot of things. So, um, so because of that, I've moved in and out of, Hey, this thing's built and I'm doing overall well to, wow, I'm really stressed out and working a lot, um, based on where I'm at in terms of keeping up with the hiring, with the growth in a market that is as hard as ever to get quality talent in. Mm -hmm. So that essential wholesaling team was, I had a lead manager, uh, an acquisition manager, someone in charge of dispositions, and then someone in charge of the office, if I remember right. Uh, and my dispositions was also doing uh, my project management uh, at the time. Um, and I mean, you can run a decent amount of revenue through that. But once you start doing, you know, over 100 deals, you definitely need a bigger team than that. So that's when additional people started being added in from there. When someone just hears, when somebody has like around, you probably have around 10 people, I'm not a, not a numbers guy, but when somebody hears about a team that size, if they're not that level, it's not, it kind of sounds a little grandiose. Are you, is it as simple as like trial and error, just the amount of volumes coming in and you're waiting three, four months, ideally, and trying to hire somebody where you're saying it's a hard market to, or, you know, it's a, it's a challenging time to hire people. Like, is that the simple general Jason Lewis guideline of hiring and scaling your team is just three, four months out? bring somebody yes. on that yeah. you're you wanna, Yeah, you want to hire to where you're going to be. But I will say as well, like that we have one of the most abundant industries on earth. Mm -hmm. I, I was talking, you know, pretty early on, I got involved in masterminds and I was talking to people that were where I wanted to be uh, and said, hey, you know, when, when I get to this point, what is my team going to need to look like? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and actually included in, so in our goals, we, um, we ran in the Utah company still to this day, we run the four, off the four disciplines of execution where we have a weekly scoreboard meeting, quarterly goals. Uh, and a lot of people will do EOS or empire. Um, that's what I do in the investor machine company, but in the Utah company, again, I figured out a lot of this stuff on my own before I joined masterminds and learned that everything was much easier, uh, than I thought. For sure. Um, you know, you, you start in just listening to podcasts uh, but then, uh, a lot of that information gets consolidated once you're in the masterminds. Mm -hmm. Um, so, um, you know, in order for us to hit our quarterly goals and get the bonuses and everything else, we always had a revenue goal and a, a team building goal. So I would actually build in, in the spreadsheet. We'd say, Hey, this is where we need to be this week, this week, this week to hit the revenue goal. And then off to the side was the org chart and the squares were either red, yellow, or green. Uh, if, if we were working on somebody, they were yellow. If they were hired, it was green. And so I got my whole team's buy-in to helping build out the org chart. And a lot of that org chart building came from referrals. A players, no A players. So if you've got A players on your team, they're the, one of the ultimate sources to be getting 
additional uh, people for your team. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the most important things that you're hitting on is like masterminds, like the accountability, but also just direct access to, Hey, I see this guy. Hey, if, if you're, you know, don't have as many people as Jason Lewis, or you hear this and you want to hire a relationship manager and you're in a mastermind with him, Jason, man, let's sit down at lunch this day. Like I'd love to pick your brain and, you know, provide value back to you. That's like the most important thing. If, if not one of the most important things for sure. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're, they're great programs to be a part of. So, I mean, essentially, I just continued to do that all along the way. I will say job boards have always been one of the least effective ways to find people. That's not to say that I haven't done it and hasn't worked, but you're much better off to get people through networking, Facebook posts, sending emails out to your wholesale list, talking to the people that you already work with. Interesting. Sending out to the wholesale list. I love that. Yeah, that's how I got my most recent acquisition manager, who's an absolute all-star. Amazing. Great tips here, guys. Just learning about data, learning how Investor Machine scaled their company. You know, Jason's story of how he just pretty much four times went and <laughs> told a guy he was going to work for him and then, um, you know, pretty much went off on his own shortly after that. So amazing, amazing stuff. To end here, I'd love to get your opinion on where the market is now. We've talked as far as different timeframes, different, um, you know, areas as far as where you're selling ARV at on the back end, but I'd love to hear in your opinion where the market is now and just your perspective or philosophy on what your plans do the, the remainder of this year and moving forward. Great, great question. All right. So, you know, I, I've listened there. There's a guy named uh, Ken Burns who's really, really smart market wise. Mm -hmm. Like this guy's whole job is to forecast the market. Home Depot, Lowe's, American Homes for Rent, DR Horton, any of these big companies pay this guy to forecast the market. And in some of these masterminds, I've heard him come in and, uh, and, and talk. Um, he came into uh, Collective Genius specifically. So I, I mentioned a lot about masterminds. Uh, let me name my specific masterminds. I love the Collective Genius. I love Investor Fuel. I'm in both of those masterminds. I'd highly suggest them both. So Ken Burns came into the Collective Genius. Um, and one thing when he ever, anytime somebody really good ever talks about the market, he talks about major metropolitan area markets, the Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and the Salt Lake city market are not the same. They, and they don't behave the same. Um, and so I would suggest to anybody, make sure that you're doing national, but also local market research. I mean, even in like 2008, 2009, 2010, if you're in Vegas compared to if you're in Indianapolis, you had two very different experiences with what the market did. You know, Vegas looked like this, bam, bam. Uh, Indianapolis looked like this. Uh, like not, not, not a big difference. Swing. And I, I, I know that's true on Vegas. I believe that's true on Indianapolis. Don't necessarily quote me on that. So realize like whenever people are talking about the market and what they think they're going to do, they're grossly um, influenced by the market that they live in. Mm -hmm. um, Salt Lake Great City point. is... Yeah. So Salt Lake City is one of the hottest markets. If you look at Realtor.com, Zillow, you know, any of these people that do market for forecasting, they, they all say Salt Lake City is projected to be one of the hottest markets we have. We're incredibly good at having children in Utah, which adds to the market. And we have a big influx of people moving in. We're locked between a mountain range and a lake. So we don't have a ton of land to be able to uh, expand out to. And so because of that, we're hot. Um, so in Utah, we're projected to continue to have things go up, um, not at the same rate as previous. Um, uh, interest rate, I mean, obviously there's things that are gonna affect this a lot. Interest rates uh, are gonna make a pretty big difference uh, on this. Uh, as, as interest rates go up, people's monthly payments go up. Um, so that's something that's definitely going to affect negatively. You have affordability that's continuing to affect negatively, but you also have things that are continuing to affect positively. Overall, uh, wages going up, inflation going up, and you also have Wall Street dumping buckets and buckets and buckets of money into single family housing. Um, a few years ago, single family houses became an asset. We have the Fed doing quantitative easing, printing trillions of dollars. Uh, you know, that, that money is going somewhere uh, and it's to, to play, you know, companies like, you know, BlackRock, Imagine Homes, things like that. These hedge funds that are buying up tons and tons and tons of single family homes at incredibly uh, high prices because it's Wall Street money. So all of this money 
is is continuing to dump in. You have I buyers and things like that. Like that, all of these things definitely impact the market. So that's a long lead up to my opinion is market will continue to go up, level off for the next little bit. I don't think that we're due for another 2008, 2009. But my opinion too is that when we do have some type of correction, I think it will be, uh, you know, outside of the Fed printing a whole bunch more money, doing a whole bunch more quantitative easing, things like that. My, my guess is that it will be a longer recession. There's a few levers that the country and the Fed can pull to get us out of a recession. You know, you can print money, you can lower interest rates, uh, all of these different things. They pre-pulled those levers to put off the recession rather than using it to fix the recession. This is why it's been so long since we've had a recession is because we're keeping interest rates low. I mean, yes, they've just gone up, but they're still historically low. And so the levers are already pulled. When we do go into a recession, it will be interesting to see how we dig out of it. So my general philosophy on all of this, again, uh, I'm a child of the recession. I have always invested in the bottom of the market. Um, every home I ever flip, I would be perfectly content to own for 30 years. Uh, I'm really careful with my um, money that I get and borrow. Um, make sure you have long notes and things like that, because the, the thing, you know, in a market correction, as long as everything can rent and debt cover, and as long as you have enough liquid capital to survive this, uh, the bottom side of a recession is one of the best times ever to be an investor. The problem is everybody gets wiped out on the ride downhill and doesn't have any access to capital on the other side. Um, so make sure you have access to plenty of capital. You're being smart financially and hang out in the overall bottom end of the market. And when the recession happens, it happens and you're going to be fine. Fantastic. Fantastic. That was, that was a long answer. No, okay okay that this. was fantastic. I'm more than okay with it. Fantastic, <laughs> man. This has been a great interview. What's the best place to touch base with you, follow you, anything like that, Jason? I'm going to have everything on Investor Machine and Investor Fuel in the show notes, in addition to just like the synopsis, blog post, everything that comes out as well. Um, yep. What's the best place to follow you? Uh, I'm probably most active on uh, Facebook. Facebook. Um, awesome. So um, I don't know. You're, I'll get you the link to my Facebook uh, if anybody would like to follow me there. And I don't have 5,000 friends yet, so I'm still totally following. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, thank you guys for checking this out. It has been an awesome episode. Awesome guy, high level business. Um, businesses on the lead gen side, the dump free direct mail with investor machine. Our members know it and love it, have really been implementing it, especially the last six ish months or so. Um, and cool story out in Utah with a high level guy in CG and investor fuel. So awesome stuff, Jason. Thanks for coming on. I'm excited for this one to come out. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you. Have a great one.